This is part 6 of my lecture on diagnostic accuracy where I'm going to talk about how we define a good test. We've already seen in the previous part of this lecture how we can define an ROC curve, a receiver operating characteristic curve, where we plot sensitivity against specificity and show how they change as we change the test threshold to give us uh, a curve the ROC curve and we choose a point on that curve which is our operating point. So we could choose an operating threshold of 170 centimeters which gives us 80% sensitivity and 80% specificity or we could choose to operate at a different threshold giving us a different combination of sensitivity and specificity. And we've used the area under the curve, the grey shaded area to tell us how good the test is because the closer it goes to the corner the bigger the area. So the closer the curve gets to the corner the better the test and the area under that is used as a measure of how good the test is. But changing the test threshold alters the operating point and ideally we want to be close to the top left hand corner with high sensitivity and high specificity but usually we can't get both at once so we have to compromise somehow. And that depends on which is most important, sensitivity or specificity. And in fact the optimal operating point depends on several things. It depends on the prevalence of the disease in the population that we're studying as well as the consequences of an incorrect result which is worse failing to detect the disease or incorrectly saying that it's present. So we can make a choice between a very sensitive test or a very specific test, although rarely do we manage to achieve both at the same time. So let's first of all look at a population with a very low prevalence. I've taken an exceedingly low prevalence of 0.1%. So very, very few of our patients actually have anything wrong with them. So I've taken a large number of patients. We've got 10,000 patients here and a prevalence of 0.1% means that 10 of them are going to have the disease whereas 9,990 will not have the disease. And I've put in some figures here for a hypothetical 10 true positives and 7,992 true negatives and if you work out the figures for sensitivity and specificity you'll see that gives a very high sensitivity, 99% uh, I've called it, and a moderate specificity of 80%. So the positive predictive value for this is going to be the true positives which is 10 over the total positives which is 2008 which is 0.5% so a rather poor positive predictive value. And the negative predictive value is 7,992 out of 7,992, which is fantastic, 100% negative predictive value. But if you look at the number of positives that we've got, out of our 2,008 positive results, 1,998 were false. Only 10 of those 2,000 positive results were actually true positives. So what happens if we choose a very specific test? Then let's take a 80% sensitivity and a 99% specificity. Then you'll find that the numbers of true positives required for that are 8 and the number of true negatives is 9,890. From which we can deduce the positive predictive value is 8 out of 108 which is 7%, a little better than before, but the negative predictive value, 9,890 over 9,892, is still very close to 100%. We've got fewer positive results now. Our positive results have dropped from 2008 to 108, but they're still mostly false. 100 of those are false. So whatever we do, we have a large number of um, false positives. 
This is what happens when we have a screening test, something like mammography, where we're going out to a generally healthy population looking for just a small number of patients who actually have the disease. So the prevalence is known to be very low and we want a cheap and easy test that's applied to lots of patients. We expect most results to be negative because the prevalence is so low there are not very many positive cases out there. But we need to minimize the number of false positives. If we have too many positive results uh, we'll be completely swamped because every positive result needs follow-up of another test to check. So if most of our positives are false positives, the follow-up service just becomes completely overwhelmed. So we need a test with high specificity. From the previous two examples that I showed you, high sensitivity is not good enough. It is going to give you far too many false positives. We have to go for high specificity, even at the expense of a lower sensitivity. So inevitably, it, we are going to miss some cases because the sensitivity is not going to be as high as we like. This is an inevitable consequence of a screening test where we're going to have lots and lots of patients and only a few of them are positive. The negative predictive value of a test like this will always be high because there is a low prevalence and um, whatever test I do I will almost always be right if I say the result is negative. So we've always got a high negative predictive value. We would like a high positive predictive value such that if we get a positive result we can be confident that it's true. But unfortunately that is going to be difficult to achieve with our low prevalence and our high specificity. So inevitably we will have a rather disappointing positive predictive value which means that there will be many false alarms. A positive test doesn't mean that you have the disease and that is the case with mammography. Most positive mammograms turn out to be false alarms and that's inevitable because of the way the screening test has to work. But in hospitals very often we're dealing with a different situation. We're dealing with a moderate prevalence, a prevalence of 50%. Maybe half of the patients who are sent to us in nuclear medicine for a diagnostic test have the disease that we're looking for. After all, that's why they're in hospital, that's why they're being sent to us. So we could see, should we have a very sensitive test? Here I've got um, a thousand patients with a prevalence of 50%, 500 of them will have the disease and 500 won't have the disease. And if we have a sensitive test with a 99% sensitivity, you'll find that we need 495 true positives and 400 true negatives. That gives us a positive predictive value of 495 over 595, which is 83% and a negative predictive value of 400 out of 405, which is 99%. So we've got a high negative predictive value. That means this test is very good for excluding the disease. If we do this test and we get a negative result, we can be very confident that the patient doesn't have the disease. On the other hand, a positive result is not quite so conclusive. Or we might go for a very specific test. So I've got the same group of patients, 500 with the disease and 500 without the disease, but this time we go for a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 99%. And you'll find for those figures we need 400 true positives and 495 true negatives, which gives us a positive predictive value of 400 out of 405, which is 99%, and a negative predictive value, which is 495 out of 595, which is 83%. So this time we've got a high positive predictive value and not such a good negative predictive value. So a negative result from this test is not quite so conclusive, but a positive test result is good. It will confirm the disease with 99% certainty. So here in hospitals where we have quite a moderate prevalence, we can choose between a very sensitive test which is good for excluding the disease or a very specific test which is good for confirming the disease. So in a diagnostic test in hospital with a population with moderate 
uh, prevalence, we're going to have patients with some previous indication of the disease and we're going to expect a significant number of both positive and negative results. So as we saw in the previous example, the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value depend mainly on the sensitivity and the specificity of the test that we choose. So prevalence actually has a lesser effect here than sensitivity and specificity. We can choose high sensitivity and poor specificity which gives us a high negative predictive value so a negative result is very good because it will reliably exclude the disease but gives us poor positive predictive value so a positive result from this test isn't conclusive the patient would have to go on for further investigation alternatively we could go for high specificity and poor sensitivity which gives us a high positive predictive value so a positive result from this test would be reliable at confirming that the patient does have the disease but a poor negative predictive value means that a negative result isn't conclusive and the patient needs to go on for further investigation. So what we've seen here is that a screening test something with a, a patient population of whom very few have the disease, a low prevalence, that's what happens in a screening test that we go out to the general population who have very little indication of any disease. We need high specificity, otherwise we'll have too many false positives. Unfortunately that gives a poor positive predictive value. So in mammography a positive mammogram will always need follow-up and the same with other screening tests. On the other hand, in diagnostic testing in hospitals, we are more likely to be dealing with a moderate prevalence population. So if the test is set up to exclude the disease, we need high sensitivity because a high negative predictive value is needed to exclude the disease. An example of that would be doing a bone scan in nuclear medicine to look for metastases because a negative bone scan can reliably exclude metastases. Um, the patient doesn't have any hot spots on the bone scan, they don't have any metastases. On the other hand, a positive bone scan doesn't reliably confirm metastases because there are lots of other uh, abnormalities that can produce a hot spot on a bone scan. So the positive result isn't conclusive but a negative result is. On the other hand, we might have a test needed to confirm the disease, in which case we're looking for high specificity because we want a high positive predictive value for a positive result. An example of that in nuclear medicine is when we do a micturating cystogram in order to see whether a patient has got reflux from the bladder. Um, a positive result for a micturating cystogram definitely confirms the patient has reflux. You can't miss it. It's clearly there. The patient is refluxing. On the other hand, a negative result from micturating cystogram doesn't exclude reflux. It simply means the patient didn't reflux on this occasion. They might reflux next time they micturate. So a negative result doesn't help, but a positive one will confirm the disease. So those are examples of nuclear medicine tests that require either high sensitivity or high specificity. So that's the end of part six of my lecture on diagnostic accuracy.